from Jacob Casper. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a moment at the beginning to prepare us for something at the end in the interest of time. So I'm going to pass out some cards. Everybody gets one card. If you get a stack of cards, grab one and keep passing them around. At the end of the talk, we'll come back around to this. Thank you. So I'm a PhD student with Eric Schultz at University of Connecticut, and my work is on rebuilding overfished stocks and also on uh, restoring truncated age structures. So we know that fishing shapes population age structures. Here's an example of cyanosis nebulosis, where in different fishing mortality rates, we see very different age structures. This is age structure spawning stock biomass. And you can see in the lightest gray, when there's no fishing mortality, you have quite an abundance of uh, relative proportion of fish of all these different ages. And as that fishing mortality rate increases, from the medium gray to the darkest gray, we not only see an overall reduction of age classes, but we see a dis disproportionate reduction in the oldest age classes. And this is important because old fish make more and better offspring. So here we have two tautog, a small one and a large one. These are both mature females. The small one makes some eggs. The large one makes a lot more eggs. You'll also notice that the large fish makes larger eggs. This is not scale. And this impacts the offspring that these fish have. Small fish has fewer offspring than the large fish. And what's really important about this is on a gram per gram basis, equivalent spawning stock biomasses are not actually equivalent for the number of offspring they're going to have. So uh, if the stock is primarily composed of young adults versus old adults, and they're the exact same weight, they're going to have different contributions to the next generation. So not only does fishing modify age structures, but fisheries management modifies age structures. So if we think about different tools we have as fisheries managers, you could think about uh, you can adjust the harvest season, and you might do that depending on when and where fish are spawning, and that can impact the age of the fish and the size of the fish that are being harvested. You can also think about gear selectivity, uh, and this is the same issue where sl gear selectivity can impact the age and the size of fish that are caught. There's also minimum size limits where you're specifying certain ages, sizes of fish that are going to be harvested. And there's also harvest slot limits, where again, now you're specifying a different age and size of fish that are being harvested. So my work uh, so far has been using Tautog as my model species. And Tautog is ripe for alternative management. We started a few years ago and worked with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and developed a Long Island Sound specific stock assessment. I hope I have a point. Yeah, there's the pointer. So but prior to this work, Tautog was managed as a single coastal species, and now it's been broken down into four regions. We broke the Long Island Sound as its own uh, management region and produced this specific stock assessment. And what we found is that Tautog is overfished and overfishing has occurred. So the biomass of the species in Long Island Sound is below our target threshold values, and fishing mortality rate is well above our target value and most recently above the threshold value. So in response to this, in 2018, at the beginning of last year, uh, management was changed to target a 20%, 20, excuse me, a 20% harvest reduction for 2018. So not only do we find that the, the, um, the population is overfished, but we also see a reduction in the oldest age classes. So here we have catch pre unit efforts broken out by age class from the two Long Island Sound Trawl surveys, one run by Connecticut, one run by New York. And what we find is if we look at the 
uh, the youngest age classes, these are the one to 12 in year old individuals. This is the darkest line. Uh, color, we see them consistently throughout the survey. But as you move up and look at, say, the 13 to 17 year olds, you start seeing very few of those, fewer samples of those fish in the recent years. And then if you go to the oldest fish, the 18 and older fish, you see very few in the uh, recent years. And almost all the uh, encounters with those fish are in the earliest part of the time series. So what we wonder is, can we use harvest slot limits to restore the abundance of older fish and also to meet the harvest reduction that was taken, uh, that was the, the reduction that was taken in 2018 by regulations. So in order to do this, we need to modify the selectivity curve of the fishery. Currently, with a minimum size managed fishery, we would have an asymptotic shape selectivity curve that once fish are old enough to enter the fishery, they're fully selected. And we're interested in modifying this to a dome-shaped selectivity curve using these harvest slot limits. And we uh, summarized this in a, the Connecticut Sea Grants magazine, in an article called Throw the Big Ones Back, which is the essential take-home message of what we're trying to do with harvest slot limits. So the objectives here are to estimate the removals with harvest slots and also to incorporate angler behavior. I'll get to that in a second. We also want to identify candidate harvest slot limits that could be used in management. And with these candidate slots, calculate fishery selectivity and use population simulations to evaluate management strategies. So here we have the catch at length distribution uh, that we use to estimate removals under a harvest slot. We broke this out into three different stanzas. So we're going to look at fish below a slot, fish within the slot, and fish larger than the slot. Now, <clears throat> here I have an example of a 40 to 50 centimeter slot, just for illustrative purposes. And if we look at it below the slot, so below this 40 centimeter line, we see a light gray. Uh, and this is the non-compliant harvest that we capture in the federal MREP survey. So we've taken that and we're saying, well, you know, below the slot, it's, people are probably going to act very similarly as they act now with the minimum size. And so there's some non-compliant harvest. We're going to incorporate that in our analysis. We also have the dark, uh, medium gray color. And this here is the, are the dead discards. There's a 2.5% release mortality rate for the species. So we're incorporating that here. Now within the slot, we're assuming that 100% of the fish that are caught are harvested. And this reflects essentially what we see in the fishery. From, our, from the MREP data. Above the slot, we have two different choices that we've included in our model. The first is a fully compliant scenario, where every fish larger than the slot is released, 2.5% of them die from release mortality, and you can barely see that right there. The other scenario we've included is a non-compliant scenario. And here, we're, S, we're saying, what happens if 50% of the fish that are caught above the slot are harvested. So to, we estimated the removals for all harvest slots using uh, the, the schematic I just showed you. And here we can see uh, what the harvest reduction would look like for all possible slots. So on the x-axis, we have the slot minimum. And on the y-axis, we have the slot maximum. Along the one-to-one -one line, where the slots are the most narrow, we see a yellow color, and that indicates a very large harvest reduction relative to the current harvest. Up here, where this uh, color is very dark blue-purple, that's where the slots are the widest, and there we're actually seeing an increase in harvest. I put approximately in this black box where the current minimum size would fit into this schematic, and we've identified three candidate harvest slots. So these slots are right around that 20% harvest reduction that was aimed for by the 2018 regulatory change. And these are within 5% of that reduction. So now that we've found some slots that could work, we need to estimate the selectivity with the fishery selectivity with those slots in order to run population simulations and see how the stock responds to these slots. 
So we estimate that selectivity at age is equal to the harvest at age divided by the population uh, at age. And so that, uh, the population at age, that comes from our stock assessment. And again, with the minimum size uh, management, we would see an asymptotic shape selectivity curve. And I'm just going to show you the selectivity curve for one of the slots. And this is that dome-like shape that I described earlier. And this is for the fully compliant scenario. And I can add in for the non-compliant, well, we still see a dome-ish like shape, but obviously it's getting pushed up a little bit more from the non-compliant harvest. So let's look at some results here of these population simulations. First of all, this is what the stock, how the stock is expected to respond to the 20% reduction that was taken in 2018 without any changes in minimum size. So this is no, not a slot, this is just using the minimum size, size limit and taking that reduction, we see that the stock recovers. So that's great. So now let's look at one of the slots, uh, the smaller slot. What we see in the fully compliant scenario, uh, again, the, the dark line, the solid line is the status quo. In the fully compliant scenario, the dashed line, well, we do see some recovery of the spawning stock biomass, but it's not as dramatic as we had hoped it's below that status quo. And in the non-compliant scenario, the stock crashes. So that's not a great choice. Um, but let's look at a larger slot. In here, we can see the dark solid line again is status quo management. And with either uh, behavioral choice, uh, either fully compliant or non-compliant, the stock is expected to recover and spawning stock biomass increases. But we're not just interested in restoring spawning stock biomass, we're interested in increasing the proportion of older individuals in the population. So let's look, look at that. So here we have the relative proportion of fish 18 years or older compared to, relative to the number of fish 18 years or older with status quo management. So here we have for the uh, smallest harvest slot, and we see with either the compliant or non-compliant behavior, we see a real rapid increase in the abundance of these older fish. But then as the stock is rebuilt with the status quo management, the relative proportion of older fish in the compliance, well in both scenarios decreases, in the compliance scenario it stabilizes and is still about uh, five times more than with status quo management. But in the non-compliant scenario where the population crash, we see a large de a decrease in the number of these oldest fishes. If we look at the larger slot, again, this is the 18-year and older fish. What we see is that we, we still have this rapid increase early on. And then once the populations reach equilibrium, we, we're, we maintain about three to five times as many old fish as with status quo management. So here we have more older fish with a higher reproductive value. So where does that leave us? Harvest slots utilize a dome-shaped selectivity curve. They reduce, they can be used to reduce harvest and increase spawning stock biomass. They can be used to rapidly increase the relative abundance of older fish. And then there's a long-term increase in the abundance of older fish. And this can be used to promote the rebuilding of virgin age structure. Going forward with this work, we're parameterizing uh, with different release mortality rates. So as I mentioned, Talk Talk is a very low release mortality rate, 2.5%. And we're interested in really generalizing this for other species. What happens if that release mortality rate is 5, 10, 25%, 50%? How does that impact the outcomes? Um, we're interested in incorporating size-specific fecundity into the stock assessment and into this projection work. Because, and then that will really help us value, uh, put a value on the quality, the increase in the quantity of the oldest fish. Uh, and we're also incorporating angular behavior. So those scenarios that I used in this modeling was a 0% non-compliance rate and 50% non-compliance rate. But we're, what we're running now is a state of preference survey among anglers along Long Island Sound to try to capture uh, how they would expect to respond 
to different management strategies. And then also I'm running a starting project where I'm doing retrospective analysis to identify how, to identify the predictors of harvest change. So how harvest uh, has responded to different predictors beyond regulations or including regulations. All right, so now it's time for these cards that I passed out. So this is part of uh, the <coughs> angler preference survey. And what we're interested in is surveying anglers to uh, see what their response is to management and also to then use that behavior to incorporate into our projection models. We have uh, developed a survey that we worked through with th uh, three focus groups and we have this draft survey and those cards that I handed out have a QR code on it. And what I ask, if anybody's interested, when you have about a half an hour, please take the survey because we need feedback. We still need to refine the, the wordings and the framework of it. And so after you take the survey, there's some questions at the end that you can use. You can scan that QR code with your phone, take the survey, and uh, give us some feedback. And we'd really appreciate that. And so I'd like to thank the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and uh, Connecticut Deep. Uh, um, we also had funding uh, from Sea Grant, ASMFC, Connecticut Deep, uh, and uh, NED and the American Institute of Fisheries Research Biologists and LDAO. So that all takes some questions.